Apple has previewed its new iPhone 4.0 operating system, which has been received with mixed feelings by the community so far. Over 1,500 new APIs for developers include the ability to do things other platforms have <clears throat> had for years, access the calendar, photo library, maps, and do in-app SMS. There's also support for Bluetooth keyboards at long last. The headline improvement is, quote, multitasking, though it's a cut-down implementation that usually suspends apps and it only allows seven specific types of activity to run in the background. Apple claims this is multitasking done right to preserve performance and battery life. I think it's a bit of a clutch, but who am I to disagree? The UI will probably work superbly, which is what users care about. Also notable are folders, which allows you to put apps into specific folders, S60 style, helping you keep your vast app collection organised, plus a unified inbox, an online gaming framework, and iAd, helping developers deliver you ads in the middle of applications. Hmm... Nokia has launched a trio of mid-priced phones. The C3 is perhaps the most significant, bringing Wi-Fi and a QWERTY keyboard to Series 40 at a price of 90 euros or so, SIM-free. Amazing, this will sell by the million, I predict. The E5 has a similar form factor, but is a full S60 3rd edition smartphone. Think of it as the E63's replacement, but with 256 megabytes of RAM apparently, a first for Nokia on Symbian, plus a 5 megapixel extended depth of field camera and the usual E-series build quality and mod cons. Again, the price is impressive though. It'll come in sim free at around 180 euros. I want one. The C6 is perhaps the least impressive, but still represents the first traditional side slider from Nokia with a full touch screen. A price of 220 euros will come down quickly, I suspect, and you'll note the full N97 like widgetized home screen. This will creep across Nokia's touch screens this year. One hundred and eight shows under my belt. Phew. I thought it was high time for another in my periodic chats about the show itself to make sure everyone's up to date. Firstly, there's stevelitchfield.com as a way in, which should remain forever, even if the old UK online server ever gives up the ghost. It might even be easier to remember too. It has been just over a year since I introduced a VGA high resolution version of the phone show. What do you mean you're still looking at the old blocky quarter VGA version? 75% uh, of the people via iTunes are still looking at my small blocky feed. Change it. Use the high resolution VGA feed now, please. Mind you, even VGA is looking a little lower res in 2010, and rest assured, I'm investigating going widescreen and maybe even HD. But my stipulation that the show has to be shot on a phone is proving a hard nut to crack it. I'm simply not happy enough yet with the quality available from phones. Watch this space. A few numbers. There are 2,500 YouTube subscribers, and an average of around 5,000 people choose to watch online on their desktop by uh, using YouTube. Most people, another 40,000 or so, watch via download. They're either through iTunes or through podcasting or similar on their phone. Of that fairly large number, 40,000, there are currently only 46 people supporting me with my virtual pint of beer a month thank you scheme. This is part of my full-time work and I need to bring in more if the phone show is to continue beyond the summer. Can you help? If you can, I've got a rolling programme of giveaways from me to you for both monthly subscribers and ad hoc donators. Lots of extra view stuff that needs a good home so you can help the show and win some great stuff at the same time. You can feed back to me on the show via email or via Twitter. When commenting to videos on my YouTube channel, remember that comments won't show up immediately. I moderate every one. About one in five are spam or contain obscenities but I normally get in to approve sensible comments within a couple of hours. There's also a new form of the phone show if you're more into audio than video. I now do an MP3 version, the audio track of the main show, if you'd rather just add this to your audio podcast rack. You'll be missing my ugly mug though and all the nice photos and videos. One last thing, if you haven't tried my hour-long weekly audio podcast, Phone Show Chat, which I do with Tim Salmon, then give this a try as well. This is unscripted and we cover all platforms, releases and topics. Give it a try. Thanks again if you've been supporting The Phone Show. Even if you can't afford to send in a few pounds a month, why not tell a few friends or colleagues and help spread the word? Screen size is something that creeps up on you. I've been thinking that the 3.7 OLED display on the i8910 was pretty awesome. And then along comes the Sony Ericsson Xperia X10 with a 4-inch transflective screen that knocks even the iPhone's display into a cocktail, even in bright sunlight. Amazing. Is this device all about the display? Ah, kind of. Are there any gotchas? You bet. 
This is Sony Ericsson's first Android phone, following on from two very lacklustre Windows Mobile efforts and the Satyon Vivas on Symbian, both of which I reviewed on the phone show recently, and neither of which I was much impressed by. Can the X10 fare better? On the whole, yes. The phone is basically all screen, with just a border at the bottom for physical menu, home and back buttons. The sides are nicely tapered around the plastic back, giving the impression that the X10 is even thinner than it is in real life. 13 millimeters. A camera shutter button and a volume rocker on the right side, power button and 3.5mm jack and micro USB socket on top, and that's your lot. Fairly minimalist but undoubtedly stylish. Inside there's a 1500mAh battery that performed very well in my tests. Yes, you'll have to charge at night, but it'll get you through the day. Before I tackle the software side of things, I have to take issue with Sony Ericsson on some of their design decisions. Two LEDs flank the home button, why? Did they think users wouldn't be able to find it? The problem is that they're very bright and distracting, especially when the screen is very dim. Which brings me to the problem number two. Maybe in a bid to preserve battery life, Sony Ericsson's auto brightness setting is unreadably dim. In fact, it's, it's dimmer than the very bottom setting on the manual brightness slider. Also fixable in software are the camera algorithms, hopefully. Eight megapixel photos come out rather washed out when the sun's bright. Disappointing exactly when you'd want to be snapping. Uh, and as for videos... This is testing a video capture on the Sony Ericsson Xperia X10 Wide VGA. A pretty good frame rate. There's no preset focus though and no video capture focus. So I should be rather blurry right now. Also, there seems to be a problem with the audio video lip sync. See what you think. As with previous Sony Ericsson's, there's no LED flash, just an always on or off photo light. Go figure. What's not fixable in software is the speaker. It's tiny, tinny and a complete waste of time. Here's the same piece of music at maximum volume on the X10. And on the Samsung i8910 HD. Let's go back to the X10. That's a bit quiet. Maybe I'm strange, but I use my phone speaker a lot for podcasts and internet radio, and this is painfully cheap to listen to. The screen is utterly fabulous, but these other niggles let the X10 down badly. But let's draw a line under the hardware and turn to software, which Sony Ericsson have tinkered with, as they love to do. Under the hood, running on a speedy 1 gigahertz Snapdragon is Android 1.6. Yes, yes, it's quite old now, but I'm not going to bash Sony Ericsson too badly on this. Even HTC are taking their time with their hero. So the upgrade to Android 2.1 is obviously a bit more problematic than it seems. Sony Ericsson's main additions are two overlays, just as on the Satyon Viva, as you may remember. Timescape, shown here in which your photos and social contacts and messages are all brought into a single timeline, updated in real time. It's fun to watch, especially if you follow a lot of Twitter or Facebook contacts, but you can't really read anything as it scrolls by. Tapping on a tweet, for example, stops the timeline and shows the tweet in full, but to do anything with it, such as reply, you've got to tap again and wait while the uninspiring Twitter mobile website loads in the browser. It's nice eye candy, but I'd want to be looking through Twitter in a proper client like Seismic or Twitteroid. Far better. Ditto for Facebook. Mediascape is just a glorified gallery app. It's whizzy and has great animations, but it's really just a way to browse your music, videos and photos. And critically, it doesn't run in landscape mode, so you'll be turning and tapping and turning and tapping and so on. There's also no multi-touch here when viewing photos, so you have to tap on zoom icons here, as you also do in the web browser. It's not a huge problem, but given the capacitive display, I really can't see why Sony Ericsson couldn't have mastered multi-touch for this flagship device. Music playback is of high quality by the 3.5mm jack, but for some weird reason, my album tracks from iTunes played in the wrong order. It looks like a Mediascape bug, uh, since going to other views, the tracks are listed correctly. One more for Sony Ericsson to fix. The application bundle here is standard Android. Apart from contacts being AWOL, funnily enough, you get phone book, which doesn't sync to your Google contacts rather stupidly, at least not on the review device. Uh, Google Maps, the old version of 3, although version 4 with free navigation was a trivial install. 
the Moxie Microsoft Exchange client suite, a Mobi Systems Office Suite file viewers, and a 30-day trial of Wise Pilot navigation. Entering text is all done with the Android or Sony Ericsson custom virtual keyboards. There's no system-wide voice input here. They work well enough, but oral and haptic feedback is disabled by default, partly because it's so horrible. Here we go, over loud dings and weak vibrations. I noticed the problem especially coming from the i 910 hd which lacks the text correction but does have super oral and haptic feedback. Never mind the Sony Ericsson extensions to Android, the story here is the form factor and the screen. If you really want to see your Android apps in 4-inch glory in all light conditions, the X10 is worth the investment, but it's not head and shoulders above the likes of the Nexus One, the HTC Desire and the Motorola Milestone. The Android world, it seems, is still looking for its champion. This is the X10.